And matter of fact, growing up in a Pentecostal church, this question never came up. We didn't ever have to ask. Like I never looked at my pastor and I said, hey, are you trying to say I could keep sinning? I think I came to preach today. That wasn't that funny. Let's give a warm welcome once again to our online community, Kuha Worldwide. Thank you for joining with us. God is doing some amazing things. I'm telling you, it's not just locked up in this room. It's in our world. Uh, I'm excited to share part two of our series, uh, the first letter from John. Uh, because, by the way, today I'm going to be talking about, here we go, can you give me a turn, 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 like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to be talking about sin. There we go. That was, that was perfect. So, so, so for anybody that's ever said, Pastor Rowe never preaches hard on sin, I'm going to be preaching on sin today, okay? I'm going, to, I'm going to be preaching. So if you ever thought that you'll see a unicorn before you ever see me preach on sin, so I was scared, I beat you. So let's open up our Bibles. The reason I'm going to be talking about sin because it's, that's what we are diving into today. First John chapter 2, verse 1 through 14. We're going to read 14 verses. But what we're going to do is we're going to kind of hone into verse 1 and verse 2 and verse 3. Uh, the truth is this entire letter, this entire chapter right here, we can do maybe six weeks just on this entire chapter. Literally, I'm, I'm going through it. I'm like, I can't even get past verse 3. It's so rich with revelation and goodness. Um, so we're going to read the whole chapter, but within we're going to kind of like zoom into verse 1, 2, and 3. And I want to encourage you to go and read it in advance. You can read this entire letter. Um, it's about five chapters. You can read the entire letter on your own. It's a good read so that you can get more context of it and in it. Um, but we're going to begin reading from verse 1. And here it says, My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. By, this way, th by the way, this is going to be the best message you ever heard on sin in your life. Come on, somebody. But I'm a little biased. I'm just saying. <laughs> Dude, yo, where's my backup, bro? Sounds better with the backup. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. I love that. Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins. And not only for our sins, but also for the sins of the world. I love that because there's something about what Jesus did that didn't just impact those that would place faith in him. Something about what Jesus did on the cross that not only impacted those that would place faith in him, but it would impact the world. So here we are 2,000 years ago, and we got to believe that what he did 2,000 years ago has impacted even those that haven't placed faith in Jesus yet. And by this we know that we have come to know him. That word know him in the original context John is saying is those that come to fellowship with him. So he's not talking about those that have come to place faith in him directly here. He's talking about those that are after placing faith in him are living continuously in him and abiding in him and have fellowship with him. It says those that have done that, if we keep, it says those that have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar. Now, again, I would love to unpack that for us today, but there's an amazing message on YouTube that I saw. It's on the Kuhau account. It's preached by this guy named Ro Remedios called God's Only Command. It is a 35-minute message. If you ever want to know what following the commands of God according to the New Testament are, Please go back and watch that message. It's called God's Only Command. By the way, I devote an entire chapter on this book called Love is Our Logo, talking about what is God's only command. He says, but 
but does not keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a lie and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word in him, truly the love of God is perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Whoever says that he abides in him ought to walk in the same way he walked. Beloved, I am writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. At this time, it is a new commandment that I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you. Because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Verse 9, whoever says he is in the light and hates his brother is still in darkness. Whoever loves his brother but abides in the light, uh, whoever loves his brother abides in the light. And in him there is no cause for stumbling. Verse 11, but whoever hates his brother and is in the darkness is and walks in the darkness, is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going. There's something about loving people that directs your steps in the right direction. It says, I am writing to you little children because your sins are forgiven for his name is sake. That is so, I could preach right there. That your sins are forgiven for his name's sake. I am writing to you, young man, because you have overcome the evil one. I'm writing to you, children, because you know the Father. I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. I want to jump back right into verse 1, 2, and 3 because that's where we're really going to zoom into. And this is my little children. I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. He is the propitiation of for our sins and not for our sins only but also for the sins of the world my message to you today is solving the sin dilemma solving look at the person next to you tell them solving the sin dilemma tell them don't get scared say don't get scared we have a solution for the sin dilemma would you help me pray? Lord Jesus, we are grateful, Lord God, for just this time that we get to be together, Lord God. I'm so grateful, Lord God, that we have a family in this community, Lord Jesus. This is not just a building, Lord God, that we kind of come in and we just check that we fulfilled an obligation by coming to church, but that there is something here that is life-giving, that there's something inside what you've placed in other people that you've called me to glean from. So I thank you, Lord Jesus, for church. I thank you for church. Not a building, but a people. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Help me share this message about sin. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a strong clap or a finger of praise. Um, have you guys seen this uh, latest trend on TikTok? Anybody seen the latest trend on TikTok where it's parents that are pranking their kids? Have you seen that? It's pretty, it's pretty amazing. Like there, these, and essentially is this, the parent is running to the room, uh, rushing to their kid's room and say, Hey, listen, I need you to have my back right now because I'm going to go fight our neighbor. And they have a seven year old daughter that's about your age. And I need you to go. Teresha has done this. This was great. I forgot that Teresa, that's right. So, so they go into the room, hey, I need you to, I have someone that I got to beat up and they have a seven-year-old daughter and you got to have my back. You ever seen that? Have you seen this? This is pretty amazing. And the essence of this prank is essentially saying, hey, listen, I want to see that when it comes down to it, that you got my back. Like that's, a, that, that's a, essentially what they're trying to find out. Like, do you got my back when, it, when the going gets tough? Do you got my back if somebody is trying to attack me? Like, and, and this reminds me of, of a prank that was played a couple of years ago because my brother, my younger brother, Rodolfo, sent me a text and it says this. It, it, it essentially said this. Hey, bro, I need your help. Have you ever got this text? Or was that, am I the only one? Like, this is a couple of years ago. Hey, bro, I need your help. You can't ask me any questions. You can, uh, it's, bro, I need your help. You can't ask me any questions about it and you can never ask me any questions about it and we're gonna hurt some people. When I get this text, I do what I think is the best thing to do. 
So I respond to him, my brother, and I'm like, hey, what do you mean I can't ask you any questions? What is it that you have done that has gotten into this dilemma that now is jeopardizing my life, and now I have to go and defend you? What did you do to put you in this predicament? And he's like, yo, bro, for real? I thought you had my back. I was like, this is me having your back. He goes, that's funny because I sent it to my older brother, Raul, and he said, let me know when I need to be ready. I sent it to your son, Bishop, and he said, of course. And then I sent it to John, and John said, do you need me to pick you up or are you picking me up? Has anybody got a friend like this? Like, no matter what, they got your back. So I want you to think about that for a second. Because this is actually the kind of relationship John had with Jesus. It was this kind of relationship. I want you to think about that. Like that person that got your back no matter what. Like you can call in a heartbeat and they're there no matter what. This is the kind of picture that you want to have when you're thinking about the author that is writing this letter to his church. He's talking about someone that was so intertwined with Jesus. Someone that was so intimately connected with Jesus that he had his back no matter what. John was the disciple, one of the disciples, if not the only disciple that was there in the crucifixion while people were running away, while some of Jesus' disciples were doubting, while some of them actually denied him. John is like, listen, if you're going to kill him, you might as well kill me because that is my best friend. I'm a ride or die. I'm going to be there no matter what. I got his back. That's the kind of relationship that... John had with Jesus it was this relationship like yo I got his back no matter what and the point it was to the point where John after the resurrection and after Jesus's ascension John was persecuted as a pastor of a church to the point that he was boiled in oil history will tell us that he was boiled in oil he somehow survived that. This is John. Now, he could have denied his allegiance. He could have denied his fellowship. He could have denied his connection to Jesus. But John was so devoted and dedicated to this relationship that even to the point of persecution, he said, I'm not going to deny the person that I have fellowship with. I'm not going to deny the person that I am intertwined with. I'm not going to deny the person that I've given my life to and that give, that's given their life for me. I'm not going to deny. So much so they even poisoned John so that he could die. And guess what? He miraculously survived poison to the point that they banned him to an island. This is the kind of author you're hearing from today. You're hearing from an author who everything he's, he writes is with conviction and with passion. Picture Lisa worshiping. That's how John's writing. He is writing with such passion and with such conviction. He's not talking about, and I could imagine like, I, I could imagine him talking about his closest friend. That's how you know it's true. Oh man, it cracked. No, I'm just joking. And <laughs> This is the kind of conviction he's talking about. John is like, this is my closest friend. This is not just me, you know, subscribing to a leader of a religious group. This is not just me subscribing to someone that started a cult. This is someone that I've given my life to. This is someone that is the lover of my soul. Like, this is my best friend, greater than Will Smith and DJ Jazzy Jeff. I'm closer to Jesus than that. Greater than Zach Morris and Screech. I'm closer to Jesus than that. Greater than... uh uh a Barney Rebel and Fred Flintstone. I'm, I'm closer to Jesus than that. This is my boy. This is the lover of my soul. This is my, this is my friend who I'm talking about when I talk about being in him. When I talk about being close to him. When I, close about, when I talk about proximity with Jesus. And, and, and I need you to get this because when we're reading John chapter 2 and he starts, so much of what he shares is in this context of fellowship with Jesus. What do I mean is that oftentimes we think that what some of the writings that John is talking about or some of the things that John says, we read them and then we begin to question our faith in Jesus. But John's not writing this so that you can question your faith in Jesus. He's writing this so that you can examine your fellowship with Jesus. 
Hey, Pastor Ro here. And really quickly, I want to take a moment just to hit the pause button and tell you about three ways you can connect and support this ministry. It's only going to take 30 seconds of your time, and then you'll be able to go back to watching the rest of this video. And here's the first one. If you need prayer, give us an opportunity to pray for you. Visit prayforme.kuhau.com and submit your prayer requests. Number two, we have merchandise you can purchase and different ways that you can donate and support this content. It's all found in the description, so make sure you go and check it out. Number three, if you're looking for a church community, visit us at kuhau.com slash new and tell us where you're from so that we can plug you into our church family. Okay, let's get back to this video. This is what religion does. Religion says, look, read those things. And what John is saying is that you're, you don't know Christ. You're not in Christ. You're not even saved. And then you're questioning your salvation. But he's not saying this so that you can question your salvation. He's saying, I need you to examine if you're in what salvation has made available to you. This, this is what his purpose is. He's, he's writing this. And the best illustration that I can come up with is an illustration of a wedding ceremony in a marriage. Any married folk in the house? Come on, come on. Any happily married folk in the house? Fake it till you make it. For those of you that have to fake it, I don't have to fake it because I'm extremely happily married. Man. Uh, um, um, that's the best example that I, can, that, that I can use as an illustration. Like What he's talking about, he's not talking about the, he's not saying, hey, listen, you need to question your faith in Jesus. He's saying, I want you to just examine your fellowship with Jesus. I want you to just take inventory of your fellowship with Jesus. Are you connected? Are you intertwined? Because the kind of relationship I had with Jesus was a relationship that, that my relationship with him dramatically impact how I live my life with others. He says, I don't, I don't need you to question. In other words, it's not about the forgiveness of sins. It's, it's, are you in fellowship with him? See, it's not just the wedding ceremony it's what the wedding ceremony escorts you to. And what he's speaking about is there's so many people that were enamored with the wedding ceremony. Oh, it's, I can't wait. I have the forgiveness of sins. I'm finally going to be clean and forever clean. No, you don't understand that you becoming clean was done for a purpose. Not so that you can just be made clean. It's so that by being made clean, you can now have fellowship and reconciliation with your whole lover. So he's saying like the wedding ceremony is not the end of the journey. The wedding ceremony is not the conclusion. The wedding ceremony is what is now giving birth to a relationship with Jesus. Yeah. Oh, I could even talk to married folk, uh, uh, even right now. I heard that there's someone that's engaged. Yeah. Imagine you focusing so much on the wedding ceremony, but then losing out on what the wedding ceremony has made available for. See, see, the marriage is about, the wedding ceremony just escorts you to now living in close proximity with the person that you've made a vow to, with the person that you've given your life to, with the person that you have pledged your love to. And now every single day, you become more intimately connected with this person. Every single day, you grow in your love with this person. Every single day, you kind of get a, a feel of their likes and their dislikes. And every single day, you have a desire more to please them. Every single day, you, have, uh, you enjoy their company. Every single day, now you grow in your affection with that person. This is what a marital covenant looks like. And what John is saying is like, hey, too many of you guys have just limited yourselves to the wedding ceremony. There's so much more that's been made available to you. And so imagine you have this amazing wedding ceremony, right? Like the most epic wedding ceremony. And then once the dancing is over, once the pledges have been made, once the vows have been, the next day, you're walking as if you have been, as if you have not been impacted by the vows and the commitments that you've just made. So you, so you see what's happening here. John is speaking to a group of people that just settled with having their slate wiped clean. And guess what? The truth is that if you've placed your faith in Jesus, your, your slate has been wiped clean. But that's not the only thing that placing your faith in Jesus makes available to you. It's not just your sins have been forgiven. 
He's called you to reign in life. But in order for you to reign in life, you have to walk with him, live with him, and be led by him. If you believe that in this place, give God a praise. So this is where, this is where he says, he says, this is where we start in verse 1. Look what he says. He says, my little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. John is speaking to a group of people that according to scholarly opinion, suggests that this group of people were, were saying or were spreading rumors that, hey, man, now you don't have to do any more sacrifices. You're good. Like, your sins have been forgiven. You could keep sinning. Like, it's no thing. Like, you could actually keep doing the sins that you were doing, but now, like, your, your slate has been wiped clean. Like, you're good. You don't have to perform those sacrifices anymore. John wants to make it clear, hey, I'm writing this to you so that you won't sin. I'd, in other words, sin is you walking in less than what God has intended for your life. It's called missing the mark in the original language, hamartona. It's missing the mark. It's you accepting less than what God has made available to you. And here's the truth about the message that we share of grace, that it is almost impossible for you to share the message of grace and not, to, and not have to clarify this. This is really good. So it's so, the message of grace is so radical and it's so anti-cultural that it'll have people thinking at first, so do you mean now that God has forgiven me from all my sins that I can continue to live in those same sins and I don't have to pay for them because they have been paid for already? Anytime you preach the gospel of grace is only a matter of time where this question is going to come up. As a matter of fact, growing up in a Pentecostal church, this question never came up. We didn't ever have to ask. Like I never looked at my pastor and I said, hey, are you trying to say I could keep sinning? Matter of fact, though, but if you are getting that question, that means you are preaching the true gospel. I love it. I love it because because when you are sharing the grace of God in its unadulterated way, it, it almost sounds like it's too good to be true. Like, hey, are you trying to say that God's grace has forgiven me? And when you understand it just intellectually, at first it starts sounding like, hold on a second, this sounds like a deal. I'm going to go and keep on sinning. I'm going to go and do my sin. I don't have to perform any sacrifices anymore. I'm going to live in sin. And John's like, no, 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 no. Like, like, you don't understand. That's not the point. The point of this whole relationship with God is not stop sinning. It's fellowship with Jesus. It's communion with Jesus. It's him becoming the lover of your soul. And John's like, hey, I'm writing this to you so that you won't sin. I'm writing this to you so that you won't walk in less than what God's intention for your life. Why? Because watch this. Not because God's going to change his mind about you. He says, the reason I'm telling you not to sin is not because God's going to change his mind about you. It's because the effects of sin in your heart may change your mind about God. <laughs> Hear me. Hear me, hear me. He, he, he's saying, I need you to understand the motivation for this thing. Because it's not because God's going to now change his love measure for you. But that something about sin that is so dark that it, when it creeps in your heart, it may change your affections and your receptivity to God's love for you. There's something about sin that can creep in your heart. It doesn't change God's heart for you, but it may change your heart for God. It doesn't change how God sees you, but it may change how you see God. It may not make God doubt you and your genuine relationship, but it may make you doubt your relationship with God. Ooh. John's like, no, I, I'm writing this so that you won't sin. I'm writing this not because when you pray, God loves you more. Something about when you pray makes you so receptive to the love of God that it now stirs up affections for you to love God more. And I definitely am aware that our relationship is not predicated on our love for God, but there's definitely something about God's love for us that, uh, that allows us to respond in our love for him. Oh, reading the Bible doesn't make God love you more, but there's something about reading God's word. There's something about reading God's word that makes me fall more in love with him. Why? 
because I'm responding to his goodness. I'm responding to his grace. I'm responding to all that he's made available for me. There's something about, there, listen, coming to church doesn't make God love you more. You don't show up in this sanctuary and God's like, oh my God, open up another love tank for so and so. No, no, no. It does not make God you love, love you more. And when you don't come to church, it doesn't make God love you any less. But there is something about coming to church. I said there is something about coming to church that stirs up my affection for me to be a proper recipient to receive the love of God and transform my heart and me to respond in surrender. Me to respond in worship. John's like, listen, I, I'm writing this to you so that you won't sin. Hey, thank you so much for watching this video. And if you'd like to watch more like it, be sure to subscribe so that you won't miss anything we release. You can also hit the bell icon so that you'll be notified as soon as we do so. And if you'd like to watch our live stream service every Sunday, all the information is in the description below. God bless you. See you soon.